All right. Good evening. We'll uh, call our meeting back to order from closed session. And at this time, our clerk will read out any actions taken in closed section. Yes. Um, on a 6 to 0 vote with Trustee Jay absent, the board affirmed the conclusion of an investigation and dismissed a claim filed by a Saddleback College student against an adjunct instructor. And that's it. Okay. And as you may notice, Trustee Jay is not with us tonight. So we'll now um, ask you to stand and join us in the invocation led by Trustee Wright. Our Father who art in heaven, we are so grateful at this Thanksgiving time for many, many things. We thank thee for the freedoms that we have and to live in this great land of America. We pray for our military members and veterans. Specifically, we pray for those who are serving overseas. We are thankful for our students and our dedicated faculty, staff, and administrators in our district. This evening, bless our Board of Trustees and our Chancellor and all in attendance at this board meeting. Bless us in our decisions and efforts. May God continue to bless America. We pray sincerely in his name. Amen. Thank you. And Trustee Meldow will lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay. At this time, uh, we have some resolutions and commendations. The resolution is for Trustee Mike Meldow. This is his actually last meeting. And, uh, yes. yeah. Okay. Yeah. and, and uh, our district chancellor will present it. So would you join the district chancellor at the podium? Yes. I'm, I'm reading the resolution um, for Dr. Frank Meldow, who is um, our board of trustee member, who today's his last meeting. Whereas Dr. Frank Mike Meldow has served on the board of trustees since January 2011, an appointment that he was honored to accept, having been a community college graduate himself. And whereas Dr. Meldow joined the district during a time of great transition, contributing valuable leadership and a calm, thoughtful, caring demeanor to the board's role in accreditation issues, comprehensive st strategic planning, and resource allocation modeling. And whereas during Dr. Meldow's service, he took great interest in learning about the district and colleges extensively touring and inter interacting with students, faculty, staff, administration, offering support, understanding, and valuable fe feedback to the board and the community, thus enhancing the district-wide culture. And whereas Dr. Meldow demonstrated Im immense support to Saddleback College and Irvine Valley College through his involvement in a myriad of college and district activities, including commencements, foundations, student veterans, nursing and health sciences, astounding inventions, and the IBC Life Science Building groundbreaking, the Saddleback College Library and Learning Resource Center remodel, speech and debate, fine arts events, and community forums. Therefore, be it resolved that the Chancellor and the Board of Trustees of the South Orange County Community College District do hereby express our deepest appreciation to Dr. Meldow for his dedication to faculty, staff, and administrators throughout our district and his enduring contributions to generations of students at Saddleback College, Irvine Valley College, and the Advanced Technology Education Park. And we will miss you. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you, you're conflicted out. Okay, will you read? Uh, yes. Trustee Lane. Uh, aye. Trustee Hilder. Aye. Trustee Pratberg. Aye. Trustee Prendergast. If I say no, does he have to stay? <laughs> aye. Trustee Wright. Aye. Student Trustee Park. Aye. Oh, that has an avenue. Oh, <laughs> pardon me. Okay. Yes. All right. Now, 
you need to say? You go for you it. You can wait until <laughs> the end. Of the uh, yeah, I'll wait till the end. Okay. <laughs> okay. Well, I know that um, Mike is quite embarrassed by all this, and it makes me remember uh, back a few years ago when I thought I was going to retire, and I was standing in this <laughs> very place feeling very embarrassed. Um, so I know how he feels. Um, so uh, there, there's this resolution from the board. Uh, also, uh, I have a, a certificate of appreciation for uh, Mike All. also. He's been a joy to work with. Uh, we're really going to miss him around here. He gave, contributed a lot to our college district. So uh, this is a certificate of appreciation uh, for your, your public service to the South Orange County Community College District and your sincere dedication to students, faculty, staff, administration, and the community. Thank you, Mike. And we'll move forward with other commendations uh, from IVC, President Rockmore. Okay. Yes, for IVC, I do have a, a commendation for Trustee Meldow. I just want to tell a short story that, that uh, really sets the stage. But uh, it was mentioned that he attended our life sciences uh, dedication. And uh, once that concluded, uh, I noticed that uh, all of the other trustees were there, but he had disappeared. And so I went looking for him, and then finally, a little bit later, I see him walking out of what we call the Bees Garden. And so this is a relatively new instructional site that we have on campus. And he came back and uh, started telling me about all the wonderful things that he had learned about there. Uh, Trustee Meldow was one that, uh, as we took him on tours to the various uh, uh, programs that we have on campus, he, he truly listened, he truly learned, and truly supported us. So uh, I hate to see him go. He's going to be greatly missed. Uh, we do have a, a plaque to put on the wall, and basically it's thanking him for his support and encouragement at Irvine Valley College. Thank you. Thank you very much. Another one and another one. Well, I wish I could say this gives me great pleasure, uh, Dr. Meldow, because it does not. Uh, we are very sad to see you go. Um, I, can, I speak on behalf, and I asked our Academic Senate President, Classified Senate, CSEA, and ASG would have been here, but they couldn't tonight. But on behalf of our 1,300 employees, 40,000 students, um, to say it has been a true pleasure and uh, an honor to have you serve on this board is an understatement. Um, I will say all of us, I think everyone in the crowd and the public would agree that in the short, relatively short amount of time that you've been on here, you more than distinguished yourself as a conscientious, thoughtful, uh, intelligent, committed uh, board member in every way. Uh, the good news, folks, is he's still local. He's still part of the community. Uh, and our foundation's here, so I think they're both going to run after you and get you involved. But. Uh, um, on behalf of all of us here, all of us here and our students and faculty, staff, and administration, uh, we'd like to give you official key to Saddleback College. And it says the key to Saddleback College symbolizes the trusted friendship of Dr. Frank M. Meldow with our students, employees, and community, and is presented in appreciation of his trusted leadership. Thank you, Dr. Meldow. Thank you. Thank you. I'll keep this very brief. I'd just like to say that it has been a real honor and a privilege to have served on this board. And I'd also like to thank all of those who have been so kind to me while I've been here and have helped me through the process of learning what a wonderful district and what wonderful colleges we have wonderful students and teachers and staff all working together. So thank you so much for this. Thank you. Okay, we are now at public comments. Do we have anyone wishing to speak? No? Okay. Very good. We'll move to reports, and we'll start our board reports with Trustee Meldow. 
There's a pattern here. <laughs> uh, no report tonight, thank you. <laughs> okay. Trustee Melchicker. Um, I just wanted to keep it really brief. I wanted to say that we'll miss uh, Trustee Meldow, and um, he decided he, he didn't want to run again for personal reasons. So um, uh, oh, in case people were wondering why he's not coming back, he wasn't defeated or anything like that. So, so um, he's... Uh, um, certainly been a good board member, and he's an educational psychologist. He's got a PhD in educational psychology, so as we're discussing things, he brings forward the educational psychology point of view for our personnel discussions and the discussions we have in closed session, and it's always very, very valuable. And I also want to welcome uh, our new newly elected board members, um, Dave Lang and Bill Jay, who's not here, and Tim Jamal, who's not here, and we, we, we're delighted you're reelected and looking forward Jim to working Wright. with you. Jim Wright. Jim Wright, and Jim Wright, oh, Jim Wright, I'm sorry. <laughs> Jim Wright uh, it didn't have anybody run, running against him, so he is automatically our, our new board member, and we're absolutely delighted to have him back also. Excuse me. Thank you. All right, <laughs> and before we go forward with reports, the chancellor pointed out that I missed a couple of commendations, so we're going to back up. And we have Saddleback College uh, nursing professor. Trust, no, uh, no? sorry. Yeah, oh, I'm sorry, that one's going to wait. We, uh, the chief of police will be introduced. All right. Go Thank ahead. you. Sorry about that. Uh, my bad as well. Uh, a very important person to introduce to everybody so you could see his face and see him walking around campus, which you'll see a lot of. We're very thrilled to have with us our new interim chief of police uh, is Chris Wilkinson. Pleased to introduce you to him today. Uh, he comes uh, with great experience in the community college system. He's been the chief of police at Sonoma, I'm sorry, Santa Rosa. Santa Rosa uh, College, uh, as well as uh, Yuba uh, College as well, both in Northern California. So we're very lucky to have him and uh, wanted you to get a chance to meet him. Chris Wilkinson, everybody. Great, thank you. you want to say <laughs> Trustee Pendergast. Uh, just, uh, again, kind of agree with, uh, with uh, Marcia's sentiments about Mike um, being, you know, the veteran I am over him by by a month, I, you know, I certainly understand exactly what, uh, appreciate everything that he did to learn as much as he could as quickly as he did and, and really did a good job with that. I uh, also just wanted to really reflect and be grateful for the election coming out the way it did for, mainly for our surrounding districts that feed into the colleges because, you know, 20, 25 less school days would have left a lot of underprepared students coming into our system. And even though it would have affected more of the surrounding districts uh, community college-wise, the K through 12 would have really uh, affected us coming in. So I think regardless of your politics, it, it really is a good thing for our, for our students coming into us. Uh, November, November 7th attended the uh, college forum down at IBC and regretfully could not come down to the Saddleback one because I had another issue that I had to deal with. But uh, it was very well attended. I, I'll wait to hear on how the Saddleback one was. But um, very good questions, very, very good discussion. And, and I think it's a, you know, as our second one, I think it was a really, it's a really good precedent. And, and we guess publicly will announce that we are going to try and commit to doing two a year. N not to put anybody on the spot, <coughs> Gary. But, um, yeah, the, the recommendation is trying to do a second one in the spring. So hopefully we can do that. And then last, uh, I was able to attend the uh, Veterans Day ceremony at uh, IVC as well. Sorry, it's just closer. Um, but uh, I did discover that uh, Trustee Wright was able to do both, and now I feel like I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to challenge myself to do that next year. So, um, all right, that's it. Okay, thank you. And um, just to let uh, Trustee Meldale know, there's a pattern in this district of people who try to retire or leave. We still find things for them to do. So we'll be coming after you. <laughs> okay, um, I want to congratulate the IVC women's golf team. They are first in the state, right? Yep. Congratulations. And the IVC forensics team took first place at the 2012 Pacific uh, competition, I'm not sure. We'll hear more about that from you, I'm sure. <laughs> All right, and um, I did, uh, of course, attend the two forums on the 7th of November, one at IBC and one here. This one was very well attended as well. 
and it didn't go or run as long as the one at IBC, but it was very well attended and very successful, and I agree we need to do it twice a year. Uh, of course, I've been to several football games. Unfortunately, we didn't make it in the playoffs. It was very controversial on Saturday, um, and I had to miss that game, but I listened on KSBR. And uh, there's like a preseason tournament of uh, basketball going on right now, and it's the women's season, um, but then the men will come up. So um, I didn't see IVC in that lineup. So the turn, yeah, preseason tournament. Okay. And then uh, the Saddleback Chili cook-off. So that's my report. We'll now move to Trustee Wright. Thank you. Uh, let me also express my congratulations to Mike. Mike, for, those re for that resolution and those three accommodations that you received. They're well-deserved. We're going to miss you serving on the board. I appreciate getting to know you. I remember when I first met you and took you through the science math building and showed you why we need a new science building. So, <laughs> Thank you. Uh, congratulations also to Bill Jay and David. David Lang and also to uh, Tim Jamel. Uh, my wife was very grateful that I, that I ran unopposed, so I, I made her day, so thank you. I did attend also a number of uh, events. Uh, first of all, starting on uh, October the 30th, I went to the K-12 through Partnership Breakfast at Saddleback College. That was very well done. Had, had good attendance there. Very well done. And then I also stopped by the transfer college fair that Saddleback College had. That was at 10 p.m. for just a few minutes. On November the 3rd, that was a Saturday, I attended a football game. It was my third one for the year, and uh, we won that game uh, very easily, 66 to 42. So, And then on Wednesday, November the 7th, uh, I attended both college-wide forums at both IVC and at Saddleback, and they were very well attended. And I, I appreciated the, the openness and uh, the questions were asked and answered, and so I thought it was very well done. I also attended both uh, Veterans Day ceremonies at both, IV, at both Saddleback and IVC. And uh, uh, I was honored. Uh, I was the keynote speaker here at Saddleback, so that was a, I was greatly honored by that. Uh, also, I just wanted to report that on Thursday uh, last week, I went to the plant sale. This is the first time I could get there early. I've usually always been able to get there on, in the afternoon or late on Friday, and the plants had been uh, picked over, but I got there in time to, uh, got there at 9 o'clock on Thursday so I could buy some nice plants. I think that's very well done. Uh, again, just congratulations to everybody. I wanted to uh, let President Rockmore know that I've read his uh, president's report. I thought that was very well done. And then also an update that he gave on what IVC has been doing. And then at Saddleback College, uh, uh, they, this Professor Phyllis uh, Kuchari uh, was, uh, was named the National Educator of the Year by the National Organization for Associate Degree Nursing, which is wonderful. So that was, she should be congratulated. That's my report. All right, thank you, Trustee Lane. Yes, I'm going to uh, add to the chorus of voices and uh, uh, thanking uh, Trustee Meldow for his uh, service on this board. Uh, I think one of the things that uh, some people commented on earlier uh, that all of us were impressed with was the intellectual curiosity that you showed throughout your term in terms of really trying to find out what makes these colleges tick. And uh, my hat's off to you for uh, really a job well done. Um, Again, uh, congratulations to uh, my fellow colleagues who uh, were reelected to the board. Um, I also attended a number of uh, different events uh, since our last meeting. I, uh, along with the other trustees that were mentioned, uh, attended the two college-wide forums. Thought those were very well done. Thought the questions were very good, and I thought it was just a very good exchange of ideas uh, among colleagues. Uh, after the Saddleback. Um, uh, forum. I managed to also make it to the uh, the chili uh, cook-off uh, and brought home a couple of pieces of ceramics uh, that was in support of the ceramics uh, department and um, uh, really a, a, a nice event, uh, a lot of nice folks that attended that. 
Uh, and then finally, I just wanted to wish everybody a very uh, happy Thanksgiving, a very safe and happy Thanksgiving. Thank you. And student trustee Heather Park. Um, on November 7th, I was able to attend an ASIBC meeting where we had a really good presentation regarding um, a recent incident at IBC. Um, we had a police officer from Fullerton College who was in charge of a rape pre pre prevention program who spoke to us about how to stay safe on campus and just avoiding dangerous situations in general. Um, I've actually been working with IBC's um, sociology department. Um, we are trying to form a sociology club and we have a really good group of students right now that are really working hard to get this club together. Um, congratulations to the IBC debate team who did really well a couple weeks ago. I'm sure he'll talk about that later. Um, he was actually recruiting me onto the debate team earlier. <laughs> and um, congratulations again to everyone who was re-elected. It was my first time voting so that was exciting. <laughs> All right, thank you very much. And we are now at the Chancellor's Report. Yes, I'd like to uh, point out a, a few items uh, tonight on tonight's agenda uh, that I think will be interesting. Number one is uh, one of the discussion items is uh, Student Success Task Force Recommendation 3, Incentivize Successful Student Behaviors. So we'll be hearing about that. Uh, there'll be reports. Uh, that I'm looking forward to from both Saddleback College and Irvine Valley College Foundations. And I see they're represented out here in the audience and we look forward to hearing from them. And lastly, uh, the board will be uh, hearing a report from our uh, auditor of the district books for, for last year and uh, presented to the board for their acceptance. Okay, and we are now at board requests for reports. Are there any board members wanting to request reports? Okay, seeing none, we are at item four, but we're going to advance item 6.1, the district audit report, um, before the discussion items. So I'll have Vice Chancellor Fitzsimmons present this, please. We have our auditors here. Um, Jim Godsey is going to come up and present the audit report for us. Okay, and he'll introduce himself okay, and his staff. Good. good evening. Thank you, Deborah. Uh, good to see you when, everyone again. Uh, we have, uh, my name is Jim Godsey. I'm the engagement partner from the CSG and O'Connell. Uh, we've completed our examination of the financial statements uh, of the district for the fiscal year ending June 30th, 2012. Uh, those financial statements include the business type activities, the aggregate discreetly presented component units, basically your foundations, and the fiduciary funds of the, uh, of the district. Our audit was performed in accordance with generally accepted uh, auditing standards and governmental auditing standards. We performed all of the tests that we, re we felt were required. There were no restrictions placed upon us uh, during the course of the audit. Based upon our audit, uh, we have expressed an unqualified opinion uh, dated November 9th, 2012. An unqualified opinion basically is a clean opinion indicating that the financial statements fairly present in accordance with generally accepted accounting standards the results of your activities and your balances as of June 30th, 2012. Uh, we did have the opportunity to meet with the three members of the audit committee. Uh, and they, they were asked, able to ask quite a few questions. We appreciate your input on that. All of those items were um, addressed and, and put back in before the final financial statements were released. Uh, in your package tonight, you have a letter from us to, uh, dated November 9th. Uh, that is what we refer to in the, this profession as our required communications. Uh, I'm just going to hit a couple of these items. We won't go through all of them. but. But the key items here, we're trying to emphasize that these financial statements are the representations of management. We're, we're, not, we're the auditors of these financial statements. We're not the preparers. Now, we do assist management with some of the accounting treatment and questions that come up from time to time. But these are really the representations of management. Our job is to come through and audit those. Management's responsibility and, and part of putting those financial statements together is to adopt the appropriate accounting principles that the district will use to, to you know, create those financial statements. 
those accounting principles are all identified in note one to the financial statements. So that's a very, very key part. There are different areas within different types of accounts where the district does have options as to what is appropriate to record and how to record that. We review all of those accounting principles each year. We agree with them that they are the appropriate ones for the district, and we're also looking to see if they've been consistently applied from year to year. If there's been a break or a change in that, we would note that. That was not the case this year. One of the critical items in the presentation, uh, in any financial statement audit, uh, is the management and transactions requiring uh, estimates on the part of management. Uh, estimate by definition requires some skill, some insight, and some judgment. Therefore, it's subject to a little bit more risk, and we look at those, very, uh, those items very closely. One of the key items in these financial statements that includes this management estimate, of course, is the other post-employment health care benefits. Uh, and we've got uh, a number of times in the financial statements that those come up. We have looked at those very closely to make sure that the appropriate disclosures and the liability outstanding from the district has been recorded properly. We also have a number of notes, uh, the notes to the financial statements. I've, it wasn't that many years ago. I guess it was a long time ago. I've been doing it for a long time. But, I, you know, the notes, it was two or three pages. If you look at this now, these notes go on for 30 pages or 40 pages. Uh, they become such an integral part of truly understanding the numbers in the financial statements because there's a lot of different applications that are important. There's a couple of notes here I wanted to point to, bring to your attention. The first one was note two dealing with the restatement. Uh, there were some construction and progress costs that were incurred in prior years that had not been recorded. So those have been added back in and actually had the impact of increasing your net assets or the net assets of the district. Another key one, of course, and given to today's current times, is the employee retirement plans those relationships between the district uh, and, and CalPERS and, uh, are, are laid out in detail here. The last one is the one I already mentioned, is Note 10, dealing with the post-employment health care benefits. Uh, again, uh, you have opened up a trust account now, uh, so that some funding progress has, has been started on that. Those are very significant items that have a great deal of impact on your operations. Uh, our job, believe it or not, is to make sure that this document called financial statements, uh, the standards actually require us to see that the financial statement disclosure, disclosures are neutral, consistent, and clear. And if you've ever read these financial statements, you can appreciate that's a challenge to make sure. The neutral part is pretty easy. That's, that's the objective, making sure that these financial statements are objective in their presentation. The uh, coming back and making them consistent and clear is, is a challenge. Uh, it's very detailed technical areas. We did not encounter any significant difficulties during the course of uh, performing the audit this year. Any audit is challenging. It requires the tremendous effort of everyone, not only in your fiscal area, but throughout the, the district. We're talking to program people. There's a just a ma you know, numerous number of people, including board members who we've interviewed and worked with and discussed. Uh, we thank you for your participation. It made it possible for us to accomplish the audit. We've identified on page two in the letter a number of areas in here, what we refer to as audit adjustments. Um, uh, these were areas that we identified during the course of our audit. We presented these to management. Management has booked all of these items and included all of these items in the financial statements. There's actually only uh, two items that apply to the district. The remaining items all applied to the foundations. Uh, we did not have any disagreements with management over the application of accounting principles. Uh, if we had, we would be bringing those to your attention today, but that did not, did not happen. Uh, we have requested that management provide to us written representations, uh, that they're taking responsibility for the information that's in the financial statements, that everything that is there is, is properly recorded, and everything that should be in the financial statement has been included. Um, 
we were not aware of any consultations that management had. If management had been out, we, the, the term we use is opinion shopping, you know, asking other auditors, well, gee, would you, how would you handle this? Or could you, we, uh, if, if that came to our attention, the standards say that if, if another firm was approached, they were required to talk to us. We were not aware of that. So there was no controversies here that we would bring to, otherwise bring to your attention. Um, we do have other information in the financial statements. That other information uh, is not, it's not audited. It's not, we don't express an opinion on that. It's in relationship to the basic financial statements as a whole. That includes your required supplementary information, your other supplemental information, which is the uh, single audit. This is your federal financial assistance that is audited as part of this and included in this package. Uh, and then we also have the state compliance. There's a, any number of state compliance issues we're required to come through and test each year. That concludes my prepared statements. Uh, if there's any questions uh, from the board that I could uh, address at this point in time, I'd love to do that. Trustee Pinnergas. Yeah, uh, I guess it's page four of Exhibit A, uh, the bar graph that shows the FTEs. You have the blue credit, red non-credit. Is it my understanding you would add those two together for the total number, or is the red taken out of the credit? This is, uh, again, management provided information. My understanding is that these are separate. So these are... Add them together for a total. You'd have to add them together to get a grand total, correct? Just to try to give you a little bit of a, a feel for the direction uh, that those both the credit and the non-credits are, are running. Trustee Melchecker? Yeah, I just wanted to say that three of the trustees were on the subcommittee of the board, and that was myself, trustee, um, well, board president Pat Burke, and board member uh, trustee Lang. And we met several times with the audit committee and with our district, uh, district financial services committee, and I feel everything is, is, is very well explained and, and very well done, and I think, um, our, our Vice Chancellor Fitzsimmons for meeting with me and, and going through everything with me also. Um, I wasn't sure what you meant about opinion shopping. Could you explain that? Because I, I hadn't heard that term before. Thank you. You don't see it very often in, in the governmental settings, especially in higher education. Where you see that is in corporate America. Uh, very often you've got firms out there that they really want to present a particular revenue stream or expenses in a very certain way. And if they're getting pushback from their external auditors saying, nah, we don't think that's correct, sometimes they'll go out and they'll talk to another CPA firm and say, gee, this is our circumstances. Would you allow that to happen if you were the external auditors? It doesn't make it right or wrong. All it is is for the governing board, you should be aware if management has concerns or would like to have some, done something different. Uh, and so that's why the standards now require that if we became aware of that type of a situation where they were talking with other auditors about what they might think is correct, then we have to bring that to your attention. And that's all we're, all we're saying is that so did you, not happen. So you're not aware of that then? That's correct. Okay, excellent. Correct. Thank you. Any other questions from board members? All right. Thank you very much. We appreciate it. Thank, Thank you. you. Appreciate Thank your time tonight. Thank, Thank you. you. All right. We will go back to uh, our agenda now. We are at discussion items. <coughs> Number one, 4.1 is Saddleback and Irvine Valley College Task Force Recommendation 3. And who is going to start with that? All right, looks like it's going to be Saddleback. No, I don't know. Both of them. We'll have to see. They'll fight it out when they get to the podium. <laughs> okay. <laughs> They've got a crew. Okay. Glad you can't get your foot full of this stuff. Uh, so thank you again for uh, allowing us to present uh, from both colleges uh, ideas about how we're improving uh, the student success at, uh, at this district. And uh, each of the two colleges has two uh, presentations each. 
uh, saddlebacks uh, will uh, reflect um, item um, <clears throat> four, which is require students to begin addressing basic skills deficiency in their first year. This relates primarily to matters of tutoring, uh, one from English and one uh, from mathematics, two of our basic subject areas. Uh, there are other tutoring programs going on at the same time, but these are two that are in constant demand. And we have from um, the uh, math department, Deanna Abastina, uh, who will be presenting on tutoring in the math science building. Deanna? There we go. Just another demonstration of inter-college cooperation. Thank Wonderful. <laughs> we like to see. <laughs> okay. Hi, I'm Deanna Avatisi, and I'm a full-time instructor at the mathematics department here at Saddleback. And so, um, Professor Sharon Satello and I are in charge of the BSI Math Tutoring Center. So this is just our second semester that we've been in operation, but here's a brief overview. The BSI Math Tutoring Center is lo located in the student lounge in the Science and Math building. And the tutoring there is for students who are in Math 251, which is beginning algebra, and Math 351, which is pre-algebra only. Since the funding comes from basic skills, those are the students that we're targeting. We're open Monday through Thursday from 9 a.m. to 6 p.m., free of charge to all students. And on staff, we have approximately two to four peer tutors at all times. We staff it a little heavier during the peak hours and also during finals week and things like that. And it's a really convenient location for students because it's just adjacent to all their math classes in the science and math building, as well as close to instructors, their offices, and things like that. And many students find it to be not an intimidating atmosphere since there's not going to be calculus students getting tutored there. It's just the beginning and pre-algebra levels. So some of our goals is to increase student retention and pass rate for our math 351 and 251 courses and instill positive and responsible student habits. These are the levels where these are the hardest to instill in them. And we hope that when students come and have a positive experience with their math tutoring, then this will stick with them for the rest of their education. And we just want to make it an exciting math learning environment and hopefully expand and be part of an institutionalization here at Saddleback. But we're just two semesters in, so we're on our way. And as far as our future goals, we want to start having workshops that we're um, going to be providing perhaps on Fridays where we can have an adjunct faculty member or facilitator work with the students and help bridge the gap a little bit between the adjunct faculty as well as the full-time instructors. And also maybe work on creating a website for students to access. Um, some of the benefits for the Math Tutoring Center, the majority of the pre and beginning algebra classes are taught by part-time faculty who don't have office hours. So a lot of these students are left without a resource and it's hard for them to take that step when they're new on campus to go to the LRC perhaps, they're a little intimidated. So this is just right around the corner from their math classes. When I taught my 251 and 351 classes last year, I just walked them over at the end of class and I said, here's where it is, don't be scared. And we contact all the instructors too to help them you know, recommend it. And we're unified with the LRC. That way we have direct dialogue with their tutors as well. And faculty have direct access and input because we're familiar too with different instructors and in, um, instructional methods. And we make sure that our tutors tailor and match that so that students don't come and hear too many different explanations for how to do a certain problem. Um, also, the tutors that we have are Saddleback students. These are peer tutors, and they're referred by faculty. Professor Sotelo and I um, train them. We meet with them on a biweekly basis, and basically, we also send them out our lecture notes ahead of time so that they're aware of the topics that the students will be encountering. That way, they can tutor in a line where it's consistent with how the instructors are teaching. And some of them have even taken Math 251 and 351, and they're just a really great um, resource for students to have to see success on campus. Um, some of, we use the same tracking program that the LRC uses to record the hours logged in and the number of visits of students. We use the SARS track. 
So last spring, within basically our first month of being open, we nearly doubled our number of visits and tripled the time spent in the center. And as of now, this is only our second semester open, we've had over 1,500 visits and over 24 hours of tutoring to date. So we're really excited with the growth that we see. We see the same students coming back and telling their friends, which attests to the success because they're really getting a positive experience at the center. And we have um, anonymous student surveys. Some of them said, I'm thankful to be able to come here. After failing my first two math tests, I decided to start coming to your center. They should have come after the first one. Um, <laughs> and also, more hours expand. And um, this was one of my favorites. These guys, gals are awesome. I never thought I could enjoy math, which is what we hear all too often. And math is no longer scary and mean. It is a manageable challenge that can and will be conquered. I love my math tutors. So these are the things that really make it worthwhile. And it basically directly benefits students because that's the number one area where they struggle when they come in is passing those beginning and pre-algebra courses. So we're so excited with the growth. Unfortunately, we weren't able to get enough of the funding that we needed for this year for next semester. So we'll probably just have to shorten our hours and cut down the staffing a little bit. But we're doing the best that we can with the resources that we have. So thank you for your time. Okay, we have a question for you before you leave the podium. Okay, sure. yeah. Trustee uh, Printer, yes. That last statement kind of, your funding comes from? The BSI committee. So okay. when we, um, the there was a committee that decided how to allocate the funding that mm -hmm. BSI receives. So we had a project, you know, we did a budget proposal for what our expenses were going to be. So perhaps like two thirds or a little less than that was what we were granted. So basically the expenses that we have are we pay the peer tutors that we have, they get $12 an hour because they're NBU employees. And then just basic, um, you know, flyers that we make, but our expenses are relatively low because the majority of it goes to staffing the tutors. So it looks like next semester, we normally have two to four tutors on staff and we'll probably have to cut down to just two at all times and then just maybe reduce the hours instead of being from nine to six maybe just 11 to 4 or something like that, so that we can stay within what's left over. Okay. Thank you, Deanna, for the presentation, but more importantly for the work that you're actually doing with our students. I invite the board members to come down and uh, uh, see what goes on in the uh, uh, lounge area. It's very accessible. Our second presenter from Saddleback uh, is in the English department, um, Marina Amendi who has uh, been with us and is beginning to start up our tutoring program in the LRC uh, and training uh, individuals. Marina? Good evening. My name is Marina Amini from Saddleback College English Department. I just go by one name like Madonna. Um, <laughs> So before I talk a little bit about writing tutor, uh, tutors at Saddleback, I guess I need to give you a little bit of history. Um, I joined Saddleback College about three and a half years ago, and uh, we started talking about our students and how they're tutored. Um, who, who goes for tutoring? How are tutors selected? How are they trained? Uh, is it the same number of students that keep going back for tutoring? Is it different students? And so we started asking these, these good questions in our department. Um, we also had some kind of not so comfortable questions regarding how tutoring is done. For example, the uh, hands-on approach of some tutors that almost co-write some of the papers that we would see. The you know two Ts, the students would visit these centers and get their papers fixed up for them. Uh, and sometimes we'd have wonderful tutoring. So it was sort of a, a little bit of inconsistency and uh, they worked amazingly hard, the tutors, but there was a lack of consistency. So we started asking these questions. I applied for a BSI, uh, a BSI grant, just like Deanna, uh, a year ago, and I was given a small grant to run my own show, to run a small tutoring center that would implement best practices uh, based on some of my background in teacher education. And I actually just ended, I hired five tutors, but because they were young people, one got married and ran off to Texas, one never finished his paperwork, and I trained three tutors, and we had a small tutoring center that was, um, that, that worked quite well, and they had professional development. We had something kind of controversial, this hands-free approach, where tutors didn't actually write on student papers. And so this was a big deal. We, we implemented this very small tutoring program, which this year has now been institutionalized in the entire um, LRC, the big tutoring program at our uh, college. And 
Uh, this year I trained 19 people. So uh, this was a huge shift from the three that I trained last year, including faculty, instructional staff, uh, and peer tutors, and also professional tutors at the LRC. Uh, next year, we'd like to double that number. And so um, we're really looking at our tutoring and, and how we're doing it. So let me see if this is going to work. So some questions that we ask were, why do you know, students seek tutoring? Sometimes the professor tells them, go get tutoring. You need help on your paper. <laughs> you know? They like a better grade, self-improvement, extra time and feedback. Perhaps their uh, professor doesn't have office hours, as Deanna pointed out as well. Uh, but typically, and uh, Trustee Meldow from his background in psychology can kind of uh, probably concur, is often there's some kind of dissonance. There's a problem that leads a student to tutoring and they end up at the tutoring center. And so how is that problem solved? You've got the tutor, the student, and then the problem, the paper, <laughs> and, and what brought them there. So there's a lot of different theoretical models when we think about how to solve that dissonance in tutoring. And uh, this is sort of the theory of how we tutor. Oftentimes what has happened in tutoring is the student hands the tutor the paper and the tutor fixes it and then gives it back. And there's very little interaction. So the arrows I've kind of you know, drawn here have to do with the student handing the problem to the tutor and the tutor fixing it. Another model is the student talks about the paper and the tutor talks about the paper and they both talk about the paper at the same time. So they're kind of co-addressing uh, the, the problem or the dissonance and, and taking care of it. The approach that we've now embedded in the LRC, which I introduced in the BSI tutoring program, is a, a third model, which is that the student is the agent of the paper. The student is the agent of all change that occurs on that paper. The student owns the paper and the writing. And although it might sound commonsensical, this is really uh, radical in terms of how tutoring is done. It really means that we have now adopted a hands-free policy. The tutors may not write on student papers. So in the past, and this is a, a picture of a paper that one of my own students submitted a year ago, you can see that there has been line by line editing done by the tutor's hand. And this is the typical sort of feedback that we would see from our tutors. Another example is this one. I know it's a little bit hard to see, but there's entire lines crossed off by the tutor's hands and rewritten. Uh, uh, you know, I almost at that point requested that the tutor could, like, write his name as a co-author for that one. Um, <laughs> but you can kind of see that that student is not enabled to fix her own writing. That student has now sort of been uh, accustomed to handing the problem over to the tutor. So we've, we've moved from that, and we've really moved to this new model, the, the third model, uh, as I mentioned, where the student owns the paper. And we, we have implemented the use of questions in the tutoring session, probing and clarifying and getting the student to consider what needs to be changed and why. Perhaps that means revisiting the professor's prompt, explaining concepts, thinking out loud, and having the student sort of adopt the thinking that goes behind correcting and revising writing, um, asking the students to then fix the errors after they're taught what those errors are. Higher level critical thinking, you know, about whether they're on topic, how their paper is organized. Um, and then this interesting concept of our job as tutors are to, is to improve the writer not the piece of writing. So as an English professor, I can take a horrible piece of writing and within a 30-minute session make it an A paper. I can do that. I ha and many of my tutors can do that because they're exceptional students and writers themselves. But that's not the point of the tutoring session. So we're re-envisioning the tutoring session as it's not your job to take that paper from a D paper to an A paper. Your job is to teach that student within the 30-minute session one or two or three new strategies for becoming a better writer. So then the student owns that success and can apply it to future writing. So this is the idea that the student becomes a successful writer and thinker, and um, we are just a scaffold in that road to success. We're not a crutch for them. 
And then finally, that hands-free policy, which has caught on. We've now got it posted inside of the um, session in California cell phone law as well. <laughs> so the tutor training, which I've uh, led at Saddleback, as I mentioned, we've really expanded it, and we hope to require it of all tutors. Um, screen interviewed, recommended by faculty. Most of them are peer tutors. Uh, who, are, who are very successful. Unfortunately, the problem with peer tutors is many of them transfer out every semester and we lose them. So we're constantly filling the pipeline with new, uh, with new tutors. They get at least 10 hours of professional development, um, which I lead. It includes readings of theories of learning and practices and um, some of these models, multiple intelligences, the psychology of learning. A lot of that is embedded in, in how they're trained for tutors. Um, and then formal feedback and evaluations by faculty, which they've never before had as a formal process for tutors at Saddleback. So this year, they get formal feedback and conferencing by faculty members um, who will help them to sort of perfect their art. And then peer-to-peer -peer observations, we're supporting them learning from each other. The system of uh, if this tutor has a really, you know, strengths in MLA or, or something that you want to learn from, supporting them from learning from each other as well. And then classroom visitations as well. Um, to kind of wrap up the, the next sort of trajectory for tutoring and writing, where we see tutoring and writing going at Saddleback College and implementing some of these best practices, uh, we'd like to start embedding tutors in basic skills classrooms assigning one or two tutors in um, classrooms where the students are struggling. I know my colleagues in the math department are already piloting some of these ideas. Uh, having those tutors work directly with the professors and supporting those students. Uh, creating master tutors where the tutors uh, are recognized for special skills that they own and having other tutors learn from each other and then having students uh, learn from them if they need help with those particular skills that they've mastered. Attendance at local and regional conferences, we've also started this. I took uh, one of my three tutors to a local conference um, for the Southern California uh, Writing Centers Association, and we hope to incentivize that as well as a form of professional development to keep just the best tutors there for our students who see them. And then considering roles, really, the tutor is counselor, the tutor is role model, the tutor is intermediary. They fill this fuzzy space between the teacher and the learner, and um, really helping the, the, the tutors to own that role as well. Um, but there's a lot of exciting things going on, and um, we welcome your support and any questions as well. There's my contact information. Thank you very much. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, Trustee Wright had a question. Sorry. Let me just uh, thank both Deanna, who, who I happen to know, and, and uh, Marina. Thank you. Those were excellent presentations, and thank you for your work. Okay, go ahead. Okay. Thank you, and I'd like to thank you, too. Um, get my folks arranged. Is this one yours? All righty, we'll get them started. Um, from IVC, we're going to again talk about the Student Success Task Force Recommendation 3.4. To remind you, the first two elements of Recommendation 3 mostly had to do with enrollment priorities, and you had a special report on that last month. <clears throat> and the third component of Recommendation 3 is to try to encourage students to become full-time, and there's not a lot we can do about that without money, so uh, we're sort of skipping over that one. Could you just <laughs> introduce yourself, please? I'm sorry. Okay. I'm Kathy Schmeidler, the president of the IVC Academic Senate. I apologize. And what do you teach? I teach biology. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes. <laughs> Um, today from IVC, we have Brooke Chu and Dan DeRolay and Joel Sheldon, and I'll let them each introduce themselves to you as they come up. And we're focusing similarly, but not quite the same as, as Saddleback did, on our learning centers. So not tutoring per se, but on our learning centers. So I'll let them take their, take their roles here. 
All right. Thank you so much for having us. I don't know if we want to introduce ourselves first. or um, As Kathy said, my name is Brooke Chu, and I'm IVC's Student Success Center Coordinator, as well as IVC's Learning Disability Specialist. Mm -hmm. Do you want to hear it as we go? Sure. <laughs> okay, we'll just jump in here. Um, first, I, I was really excited at the college-wide forum that we already started talking about the Student Success Task Force recommendations, and we really began the dialogue then and was reaffirmed by the board and our chancellor and our president that we do want to be a leader in the state when it comes to this and that we want to support initiatives for student um, achievement and student success. Um, and we thank you so much for the opportunity to come here tonight so that we can continue this dialogue about how our district wants to define student success and how we want to go about achieving it. Um, it also gives us the opportunity to really show off our best practices that are already in place. For us, student success is our daily life. It is what we do. Um, and we have a lot of great practices already in place. And so for us to be able to talk about our learning resource centers at IVC um, is welcome. So we want to thank you for that. Uh, good evening, trustees. Thank you for your time this evening. Good evening, guests. Uh, my name is Daniel Duverlay. I am a, a professor of English at IVC, and I'm currently the co-chair. Uh, as you know, we do want to come and talk to you a little bit about what IVC is doing uh, regarding uh, item 3.4, and we'll be talking about two things this evening. Uh, it, it apparently takes three of us to talk about this, so <laughs> we're not as efficient as Saddleback, but we're working. We're working in that direction. Uh, I'll be talking a little bit uh, in a bit about our writing and reading centers. Uh, Professor Chu will be talking about our student success center. Uh, this gentleman will be talking about uh, our math centers, and uh, Besides our centers also, we want to talk to you a little bit this evening about some experimental projects that we're involved in at IVC as well. Uh, we're participating currently in the California Acceleration Project. And as you know, uh, 3.4 uh, not only encourages students to begin early uh, in their college careers and getting uh, and acquiring uh, classes that they will need for basic skills, but it's our job to help them move through in an efficient rate. And what we are doing this year uh, is we are combining our basic skills and developmental writing classes, this would be writing 301 and 201 at IVC, into a four-day-a-week, uh, let's see, five-hour-a-week uh, class, uh, EXP um, 389, which also requires students to spend a significant amount of time in our writing center as well. So we're running our first two cohorts this fall. Uh, we'll be running two more in the spring. Our director, uh, Professor Summer Serpice, is uh, doing very well and is speaking on behalf of IVC and the project at, at three national conferences this year on acceleration. And uh, we hope to be adding these as the term goes on. Hello, everyone. I'm Joel Sheldon. I'm the uh, coordinator of the IVC Math Center and uh, I also teach math at IVC. And uh, some of the things we wanted to discuss a little bit about our best practices as far as uh, showing that student success is achieved often through integrating counseling in things such as learning communities. Often we've seen that uh, other, other schools, and including IVC, ha has found success in incorporating counseling in mathematics courses or counseling with English courses and seeing that uh, Students are getting that extra time to study those those subjects with peer tutors in the classroom has been a uh, a benefit to them, especially with the basic skills basic skills and seeing how they progressed from from uh, fall semester through spring semester and that's something we're currently doing and we know that uh, working on those developmental courses and developing that uh, that need within them getting that extra time and Getting them into the centers at, from that from that vantage point helps them move through the courses and become more successful as they go on. All right. So first, we'll talk about IVC Student Success Center, of which you had a brochure <laughs> that you can see. Um, the Success Center opened up a year ago at IVC and combined what was previously our Learning Center as well as our Media Resource Center. Um, and I tried to include a snapshot of it there so you could see it's in a, in a gorgeous facility in our BizTech building. Um, we provide one-on-one -on -one tutoring as well as small group tutoring free to IVC students. They enroll in Tutoring 301, which is a zero-unit 
um, open entry, open exit course. And then beyond that, we also provide additional transfer level uh, tutoring as well as uh, tutoring in our CTE courses to three at-risk populations, which include our military veterans, our uh, EOPS students, and our students with disabilities. Um, in terms of our staffing, we have 43 uh, staff members, and that includes a couple of adjunct faculty, mostly NBU hourly tutors, and a few volunteers. And I won't uh, repeat what Marina did, but our tutor training uh, model is pretty much exactly what you have as well, everything down to the hands-off and all that good stuff. Um, and so we, we keep that, uh, and we want to continue to improve our training for our tutors. Um, the other piece of the beyond the tutoring that we offer at the Success Center is the computer lab access. So our Success Center is the computer lab for IVC. So we have uh, 60 uh, computer stations which are all loaded with specialized software. So students who are taking courses that involve particular software programs. And not just our computer science and our CIM students, but other, uh, you know, whether it's drafting, modeling, uh, accounting. We have a variety of uh, different curriculum that utilize software and this is where students come to complete their lab hours and uh, we have also computer lab technicians on staff who are able to assist students uh, uh, with their computer needs and their software needs. And we're doing a formal research project with Dr. Hayward and IVC's research department. But in the meantime, in terms of our program review and the SLO data that we've already collected, we've been quite successful in students feeling that the effectiveness of their study skills has been improved and that they would absolutely recommend our tutoring to other students. And we also collected a whole bunch of qualitative data with really great enthusiastic statements, uh, much like Mary presented, in terms of what um, our students have to say about the tutors, how thankful they are that we offer it, um, and we're equally pleased to have our students. I also gave you some data in terms of our utilization rates, and this is just from January through October. Again, we are a new center, so we're getting the word out to students. Um, and uh, continuing just to build the program as well as the training of the program, um, we also want to try to increase the number of group tutoring appointments so that we can continue to serve more students since we're at capacity with our individual appointments. And I'll turn it over to Dan. Okay. Uh, before Joel talks to you about the math center, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about our reading and writing centers. Uh, these are all located fairly close together, makes a nice easy one stop for the students. And we're especially proud of these places. Uh, one, one of our directors is, is so proud of her place that she didn't feel that she had an appropriate headshot actually to, to put on the slide. So Julie Evans is listed by this sad camera shy. Uh, <laughs> we also have Melanie Hayeri, who is our associate professor in reading and director of the center, and Beth Sanchez, who has been a lab technician in reading for 17 years. And uh, the reason I wanted to start with the staff has to, has to do a lot with remembering our mission. Uh, we are serving basic skills students for the most part. Uh, this definition has changed over the last few years. We're now seeing students not only coming in uh, with skills challenges, but we're also seeing students coming in with developmental disabilities. We're seeing students coming in with learning disabilities. And the population has changed, and, and what we are trying to emphasize in each of these centers is student care, quite frankly. Uh, Beth, I think, says it best. Uh, after a particularly long, difficult day last week when it was quite crowded and she had a, a very challenging array of, of students come in, uh, she said, uh, well, that was a long day, but these are our kids. And I think that sums it up. Of course, they're not always our kids. Sometimes they're our returning adult students, but that is how we feel about them. We are in this project with them. And our goal is to achieve success and to help them to achieve success as they, as they move through IVC. Uh, our reading center, uh, located right next to the writing center in order to be eligible, uh, you need to be a basic skills student who is also enrolled in a reading course. And this reading course must be a prerequisite to the college writing program. So students sign up for this accompanying reading lab or, where Melanie and Beth are placed. Uh, as I mentioned, a significant number of the students have learning and, dis and developmental disabilities. Uh, the work, uh, students complete a minimum of 24 hours a semester in the reading lab. They go in and work independently 
on a number of uh, units uh, on their computers that have that have complemented their coursework, and Beth and Melanie are there to help them along as best as, as best as they can. And there's a real relationship building that happens there. Uh, students are assisted by the lab tech and not only Melanie but also full-time and part-time reading instructors. We're very grateful uh, for that system at IVC that we have it set up so that our instructors, the, our instructors, the same folks in the classroom, are also helping the students and getting to know them on a one-on-one -on -one basis in the lab. And in terms of our usage, we have approximately 350 students per semester who are working on improving uh, a number of things, from reading rates to critical reading skills, et cetera. Talk briefly about our writing center. Uh, eligibility here is we primarily serve students enrolled in basic skills and developmental writing, both pre-college courses. Uh, students who go through IVC, if they were to begin at a basic skills level, uh, would have to take four writing courses. And to get them out in two years, we have to be fairly efficient about that. So what we have done is we have paired each of the writing classes with uh, a writing lab requirement in which they must have four conferences per term uh, uh, on a minimum for their paper. And they also must spend 24 hours in the lab as well. So they get to know us, we get to know them. Um, our students also bring assignments from courses and they receive uh, additional one-on-one -on -one fairly hands-off instruction, and uh, our staffing is what we're particularly proud of. We, we have been uh, blessed with the opportunity to have both full and part-time instructors who are currently teaching writing courses uh, and be the people who staff the center, and they're there from 8 in the morning to 6 at night, uh, Monday through Thursday, and from 9 to 3 on Friday, and we're packed out. Uh, we, we had to turn away students this time, uh, this semester, for the first time in that, uh, as you can see, we're serving about 1,300 students and holding approximately 5,000 conferences during a typical academic year, not counting our summer. Um, and we also have informal meetings uh, per our semester. So I, I am one of the people who get to work there. I'm happy to see my students and my colleagues' students in that atmosphere as well. And now for the math center. Uh, the math department at IVC has created a very, very uh, comprehensive and uh, robust math center that serves a variety of types of students. Students that are taking developmental courses, math, uh, math 351 and 353, 253, students with basic skills needs, and we provide service to them. We provide services for the for the students that are aiming to transfer as soon as as soon as they can. Many of them want to get in there and get out of there and they want help in their math classes. Well, well there's a variety of paths they can, they can take along that way. And there are many of those students that come in and they receive our services as well. And along the way, we see a lot of the students are completing their course, major course preparation, STEM students. And we get a lot of those who come in and utilize our services. And many of those students end up becoming our peer tutors that work with us. We're, on average, over the last couple of years, we've been, uh, we've been uh, servicing students at a tune of about 7,000 hours per semester. So we're getting a you know, fairly decent uh, attendance in our math center. So who we serve is a broad gamut of students. But what we're trying to do is get those students that are coming in with basic skills needs into the second tier, the second level of, of, uh, of transfer level or continuing on throughout their major preparation. The IVC Math Center, what is it that we do? Well, we provide quality drop-in tutoring in mathematics. Now, as we've heard already, quality drop-in tutoring or quality tutoring, tutoring in any way comes from good training. And uh, one, of my, one of my passions is uh, to, as sooner than later, uh, find, find a way to get us certified. I've been researching this Center for Reading, Reading and Learning Assistance, and I think um, I've heard some great ideas from, from, uh, from the uh, other presenters er earlier, and that's a lot of the things that we're doing as well. We're having in-service during the semester tutoring training sessions on Fridays, asking the tutors to come in and do some training and keep the pencils out of their hands. 
and try to find a way for them to become more you know, Socratic in, appro in approach or follow the inquiry method. We also facilitate weekly uh, supplemental instruction workshops, just like we were speaking about earlier. We're doing some things on Fridays where students will come in and discuss uh, difficult topics, typically difficult, difficult topics in their math courses, um, preferably uh, things that uh, are current and it's difficult to find out where everybody is at the same time during the semester. So we've been working really hard at that and they've been fairly well attended as well. And, and you know, it, it depends on which topic we're coming up on uh, to which class we're trying to address at that time. But we're really trying to get at those problems and help those students in another way. Try to reimagine how we're helping people and develop an activity that gets them more interactive. And these, these workshops are peer facilitated. The tutors that we're hiring to work with us and training to work with us are also facilitating a, a workshop in a more of a group session or a small instruction setting where they provide a little example and they just pretty much try to get the students to be active and work together and try to develop some understanding with things in a more enhanced way. And we're also assisting students with, with a variety of technology-based math assignments and projects, different plat platforms, course management systems such as Alex and My Math Lab, or many of our instructors are uh, assigning project-based uh, assignments on programs such as Maple. We're also assisting students with the use of gra graphing calculators, so using, using some of our expertise to develop uh, their learning and enhance those things, not just for the purposes of doing them, but to provide a, a bigger picture of what they're learning about. How do we go about these things? Well, we really truly believe that to provide support to our basic skills, our basic skills students will in, will in turn increase their likelihood to stay in school, to keep them in school and persist throughout education. To help those students Strengthen those things they've already learned. Many of them come into our basic skills math courses with some pre-existing knowledge, yet it seems like they, they have not retained that information, and we want to find a way to strengthen some of those things they already know, not try to reinvent the wheel, but maybe rediscover what they've already learned. And we want to guide everybody uh, throughout persisting in education, persisting in math, and successfully advancing through their courses, but to complete their goals. We want to find out if we can create independent learners, people that don't, don't need us to be there when they're doing their problems on the test, because we're not going to be. So the proper tutoring that we're providing is helping those students become independent math learners so that when they go on, they pass their classes, they continue on, they transfer, they get their certificate, and uh, that's our that's our principle here. And for all of us, we can we can attest to the idea that our learning resource centers, as we had mentioned, our uh, our best practices, integrating counseling in our in our courses, and also integrating tutoring in our courses. Why why we do things is to appreciate the fact that quality uh, tutoring and learning assistance does lead to and promotes success and retention, which ultimately promotes goal completion. Okay? Thank you. Thank you very much. Any comments or questions from the board? Oh, I'm sorry. Bob, you're on not finished. Go ahead. Thank you. Just to address one of the concerns of the board about the amount of money that goes to some of these projects, um, much of this money comes from the state. That money has been shrinking. We can also uh, secure grants, which takes some time to get uh, uh, that written and then approved. So that is augmented, and then some of the money by the colleges can be directed toward these particular centers. And I hope that, again, as we realign with the state mandates, that we do that. And I think most of us in the room know that um, 30 and 35 and 45 students in classes in high school are diminishing the ability of even bright students to get the individualized instruction uh, that is necessary. So we have a lot of kids coming to us without the necessary skills, and the programs that you've heard described here are there to augment and to keep those students in our classes. I think they're wonderful programs. Could you give us a total for Saddleback and total for IBC on the skills centers? Budget. 
bottom line. We'll have to ask the budget manager. Oh. <laughs> I don't know offhand. I'm sorry. Okay. Okay. I think well, Saddlebacks was provide later. Was it ninety thousand dollars this last year? BSI. Ninety thousand. Yeah. Okay. Great. Thank you. Yeah. IVC's BSI funds were a little bit higher than that. It, it's a complicated algorithm because we get BSI funds based on the coding of the of the basic skills courses that we offer, and so when we offer these pre collegiate courses, which don't seem to lead towards two-year completion of a degree, we also then get the BSI funding that allows partial funding of these learning centers. So it's a, instead of being a circle, it's more like a pretzel-shaped um, pattern of cause and effect. So some of what we've heard about tonight is funded through these BSI, Basic Skills Initiative funds. <clears throat> And some of them are funded through OSH, where students sign up for courses, and we get we get actual uh, enrollment fees for them. Some of the students sign up for no credit courses, and so we're paid the allocation is at a lower rate, right. but we still think that it's worthwhile. So the funding for these various centers is a little bit complicated to uh, to calculate. Right. Okay. Trustee Malda has a question. Yeah, in psychology, one of the big things is outcome studies, and I'm wondering whether there are any major outcome studies going on in the field right now, and if you could maybe tell me uh, one or two of them. You mean, excuse me, in terms of outcome studies that we're undertaking at IVC or outcome studies no, in the field? No, no, field-wide. In the field? In other words, uh, it sounds great what we're doing, and mm -hmm. but is it really making a difference in the long run, the amount of tutoring that we're doing per student. In other words, do they get better grades in, uh, in a four-year college? Do they go on to master's programs and Ph.D. programs? Do we have any outcome studies like that that are going on right now that anybody's aware of? Um, I am aware in terms of, um, I actually, I'd have to pull up the specifics and we could get that for you, but uh, there have been published studies that have shown that for students who require uh, remedial coursework, that the methods of integrated counseling and integrated tutoring has shown uh, more successful outcomes than students who do not receive that additional supplemental support. Um, and in order to verify that being a best practice, I know for us that's why we're undergoing an actual formal research study with a control group and with our students to look at those very outcomes, both in terms of course completion, degree completion, uh, GPA, and other outcome measures uh, beyond the qualitative data. Thank you. President Burnett wanted to jump in on this. Thank one. you, Madam President. Actually, uh, Dr. Rockmore and I just sidebarred here. Um, we would encourage, actually, the trustees to come out and visit the Learning Resource Centers at both of our campuses. You really, to, to get a full appreciation of the extent of the services, the phenomenal work that our faculty and staff are doing, it really is great to come out and visit during the regular week. And uh, we'll take you on a tour. We're more than happy to do that. Great. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. We uh, will. Oh, I'm sorry. One more comment? No? Okay, we're going to move on. Thank you very much. Our second uh, discussion item is um, Saddleback College and Irvine Valley College Foundations. Okay, and let's see who's going to present first. Okay, IVC is up first, looks like. Please introduce yourself and give us your title. So I'm not saying here what I was supposed to see. I don't think. There you go. Good evening. Richard Morley, director of the Irvine Valley College Foundation. I want to start by thanking the trustees and the two presidents for supporting the foundations in, in the way you are. Um, Trustee Padberg and uh, Trustee Wright joined uh, 
10 colleagues from both colleges at the uh, annual uh, community college fundraising conference in San Diego. And I, I hope you enjoyed yourselves and, and felt you learned a lot. Uh, for, uh, Trustee Wright was in my session on evidence-based fundraising. I hope it gave you a little insight as to what uh, Don and I and our staffs are both doing in terms of measuring outcomes in, in fundraising. And that fundraising has changed a lot just like learning has. And we know how to, uh, how to do it better than, than, we, than we did, um, say, 10 or 15 or 20 years ago. And we're bringing those best practices and state-of-the-art fundraising um, ideas to uh, both Irvine Valley and Saddleback. Um, I'd like to introduce to you uh, Bill Crosby, uh, the, uh, president of the president and chair of the board of the Irvine Valley College Foundation. Thank you, Richard. It's, it has been my pleasure to serve as chair of the foundation this year. And uh, we have a wonderful product, as you all know. The community college over at Irvine Valley College is a, is a real resource to the community, and, and we see it as our uh, goal and charge to uh, uh, maintain the visibility of that uh, institution and to reach out into the, to the community and to try to bring in the uh, uh, and develop those relationships which will nurture and sustain our, our fundraising so that we can uh, fulfill our mission of uh, helping uh, deserving and worthy students to uh, participate in our in our program and uh, just want to hit a few of the highlights of what uh, what we've been doing the last year but before I do that I just like to say a word of uh, appreciation to Richard who uh, just introduced me he's, he's been on board for about a year uh, Richard brought uh, um, uh, impressive uh, credentials from uh, an extensive background in uh, nonprofit organizations and uh, and in uh, fund development and board development, and, it, and it's been a real uh, uh, benefit to us during this past year. Um, <clears throat> this year, uh, our astounding inventions had our 25th anniversary. Uh, during, uh, during this event, we had uh, an unprecedented number of participants. I believe it was over 2,600, which was 400 and I believe 65 more than the previous year, so we're, we're right on track with that, uh, that event. Uh, just a month or so ago, we had the uh, uh, Veterans Angels Gala, which was uh, the first event of uh, uh, sort of the kickoff to a fundraising effort, which is uh, in partnership with the veterans organizations to spearhead some major uh, fundraising, which will, we hope to have culminate in May or June. With, with an even more successful event, and uh, Richard will be talking about that in a few minutes. Um, we've had uh, improvement in our baseline, or what we refer to as baseline foundation infrastructure by uh, developing for the first time a donor database uh, capable of tracking, stewarding, and reporting on donor gifts. And the foundation staff has significantly added to our pool of uh, donors by adding validated alumni information, including over 9,600 9, new opt-in uh, emails. Uh, <clears throat> bequest gifts have also been uh, a focus of uh, some of uh, Richard's efforts, which he'll be discussing in a minute. But uh, we also have new software to assist us in that. Uh, you could visit our website and, and find out about uh, ways in which planned giving can benefit the college and also about the significant tax implications of planned gifts. Uh, our uh, successful uh, pro or promote IVC campaign uh, has been uh, up and running uh, with a state-of-the-art Friends Asking Friends software. This is similar to what's been used by uh, organizations which have uh, successfully uh, done this, such as Komen Breast Cancer Foundation, Red Cross, and other similar large organizations uh, in raising money online. Uh, finally, uh, we have had uh, two new board members uh, come on. We have had some attrition as, as turnover and term limits have taken effect, and so we've been fortunate to have uh, Ernest Hackman, president of Top Gallon Energy, and Chip Corso, Vice President of uh, Advanced Manufacturing at Edwards Life Sciences, join us. Uh, <clears throat> as, as you can see from this uh, history of foundation scholarships, this last year we uh, 
uh, were able to garner uh, an unprecedented number of uh, or amount, $172,900 in uh, giving, I think, to 219 recipients. So we're, we're proud of that, and we look forward to uh, hopefully a more successful year in the future. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Richard to share some more of the financial uh, information. Thank you, Bill. In looking at uh, 2012 income and expenses, um, we were coming off of the Osher campaign that ended in 2011, and you might expect a drop or a significant drop in a yearly income um, coming off of a campaign such as that. Um, in effect, there, there was a slight drop in income, uh, being without a director for a few months and, and getting the momentum started back. But uh, for the second year in a row ever, uh, the IVC Foundation did top a million dollars uh, in revenue so that the dip was less than expected and respectively uh, over a million dollars uh, in revenue, as you can see. Um, the contributions, 388, events, 54, uh, we didn't have an initial gala. We, we pushed that gala into this year, uh, so that's why that number is a little lower. Um, revenue is, is things other than the direct contributions. Um, there's some money in there from uh, revenue from vending machines and things like that. Uh, the district support and then the total revenue. And then back to the college in terms of uh, scholarships and programs and time, uh, PR time and work time for, for me and the staff, uh, 753. Uh, the overhead was, was a, a low percentage uh, at only uh, uh, 16%. Uh, that's well within the, uh, the, the bounds of what we hope uh, overhead might be. And fundraising at 13%, which, which is really low. That, what, that should be higher. And that, that was because of the, the lack of director there for three months. That salary wasn't calculated in. And then the ramping back up of, of the new time. Um, so that pretty much summarizes our income and expenses for the year. And the specific numbers of our financial position, and I'm not going to read through all of these, but I wanted to provide it to you. I believe you all got copies of the small little blue booklet that has all this in it also. Um, total assets, um, the union balances, and really what we're looking here always uh, as a foundation being a, a corporation, really, uh, that is that looks at n not making a profit. Yes, we do want to make a profit. We want to have net assets left over. Uh, it's not a zero-sum game like higher education funding. Uh, we want to grow the net assets. We want to grow our ability. We want to grow our endowments. And as you can see, between July 2011 and July 2012, even though there was a little less in income for the year, uh, our net assets actually grew. And that is a factor of tighter controls of expenses and a better return on investment. Any questions? Uh, I don't see any. It sounds very good, positive. Thank you very much. Thanks for your support. All right. And now we'll move to Saddleback's Foundation. President Pat Berg, members of the board, I'm Jim Leach, president of the board of the Saddleback College Foundation. It's a privilege to be here this evening to talk briefly about the foundation and the success that we continue to enjoy it benefits the students and the programs of the college. When I became president, I uh, very quickly came to realize the best way to ensure one's success was to follow another person's successful tenure and keep that person around. Been successful in doing that. Uh, what I'm going to talk to you about in a moment is due in no small part to both our very supportive, committed, and dedicated president, Todd Burnett, who had working at his side a most extraordinary board president, Ms. Donna Varner. Our board is a good one, comprising dedicated business people, alumni, and interested active citizens who have a heart not only for students and education generally, but for the continued growth and success of Saddleback in particular. We've reaped the benefit of having brought on Dr. Don Rickner as our interim executive director. Don's helped us focus our efforts and generally improve the way in which we help our board members and supporters maximize their efforts at raising money for students and programs. And in that vein, we continue to focus on board development and activity. The strength of our current board will take us into the successful future. Oh, there it is. We've highlighted just a few of the significant accomplishments of the past year or so. Our gala attendance was up by 20%, again, thanks in large part to Donna Varner's leadership. 
She'll be continuing with her work on the gala in the upcoming year. Our scholarship awards are up 46% to $338,000 to 234 students. Uh, we received a single gift of some $2.3 million specifically based on and focused on our Emeritus Institute, and we counted alumni faculty member bequests of some $223,000. For the future, we've identified a database of a half a million alumni and netted over 110,000 valid active account or contacts. These will form the basis for a strong effort toward growing our alumni program and contributions from that important group. One of the college's key programs, Auto Technology, received not only a Kia Optima hybrid automobile for use in the training program, the program also received a $50,000 grant from Tuttle Click Auto Group and a continuation of the training internship program that's proven so successful. As part of our board, board development and commitment program, we've adopted a new standard and job description for current and prospective board members that includes a substantial financial commitment to the foundation from each member. This initiative been, has been widely embraced by the board. With respect to our existing funds, the most important takeaway here is the comparison between the June 30, 2009 level of something just short of $2.3 million versus that same level at the end of June 2012 when the number was almost $6.7 million. Inasmuch as we are, first and foremost, a vehicle for raising funds for scholarships and other purposes of the college and foundation, it's appropriate to note that contributions in all their forms account for 70% of our total revenue. Finally, this chart tracks from 2008 through our fiscal year end, the success that we've enjoyed in the growth of endowments. From a low in 2008 of around a half a million dollars to almost five million dollars in 2012, we have focused on growing this important element of our portfolio. The growth of the Osher endowment alone will account for some $70,000 annually to the foundation in perpetuity. In short, the foundation continues to grow in strength and resources. We're enjoying the results of some very good years made possible by improvements in professional staff, an enthused, committed board of directors, and the outstanding leadership of our Saddleback president and a capable, dedicated board leader. We look forward eagerly to the future. We would not have enjoyed the success we've had, as I mentioned earlier, without the capable staff and leadership of our interim executive director, Dr. Don Rickner. Don? Um, as we look ahead, we look at keys for uh, how do we keep strengthening what has been a, a very strong period in the foundation with Todd's uh, leadership here and Glenn's leadership with Richard at Irvine Valley, and then such wonderful board members as uh, Jim and Nancy, his predecessor. And the, and the first conclusion that we come to is that we need to staff up because uh, foundation work is like outside sales. Uh, and if you don't have more people to do the job, it doesn't get done. Um, baseline studies uh, have been done by the Network of Community College Foundations over the years. Uh, there was one in 204, 206, 208, 209. And there was also a study uh, paid for by the Kresge Foundation on behalf of the Cal Foundation for the California Community Colleges. All of them conclude that foundations with fewer than, uh, the uh, staff members fewer than four typically do a poor job. And those who are consistently four or five staff members do a much better job. Uh, for example, if we go to Let's go up here. Am I going backwards? No, I am. <laughs> Might help if we go forward, huh? Mm -hmm. Go forward. Backwards. Come on. You can do it. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> That's what I was looking for. So in the 2004 study, for example, the top 10 uh, fundraising community colleges in the state, uh, their staff which averaged, uh, by the way, four and a half staff members per foundation, raised on average a, a million dollars per staff member. If you were a, a medium-sized staff, meaning two to three staff members, then and under the column medium productivity, the average amount raised per staff member went down to 415000 if you have a small staff, one or two people, then the productivity goes to about $185,000 per staff member. So taking the top nine foundations in that same year, 2004, and looking at 
of return on investment, the cost of their staff was $5.2 million to raise a total of $39 million from those nine colleges. So somebody mentioned zero-sum game. Uh, as long as we keep having to deal with a zero-sum game, it becomes very difficult for us at some point. But the foundations offer the potential of, of offering a, a larger sum to divide among all of us. And with uh, staff is one key component to that. Um, we're fortunate here at Saddleback to have already some funds in place and some income forms so that the foundation can pay for those additional staff positions uh, rather than asking the district to do so. So we're planning to uh, add some staff in, the, in this current year as well as next year. Any questions? Uh, Trustee Pendergast has a Yeah, just to clarify then, uh, I guess for both IVC and for Saddleback, what is your current staff level? Uh, we're about three and a half people, uh, two people plus three part-time at uh, Saddleback. At Ir Irvine is uh, two, and two and what? Two and hiring a third. So you guys. So we're in the middle, and what that means is that we'll probably top out at a, at about two million dollars a year, once we've matured with this amount of staff. Uh, we have a very interesting experiment going on at Victor Valley College. Uh, the the director up there is a wonderful lady named Ginger Antaveros. She went to her academic senate uh, two years ago and said. We're now raising for the college, for the district, about $2 million a year. If you will support us having four additional staff members, we'll raise $4 million a year. The Senate bought it, the board bought it, and they are now implementing that plan this year, so we'll know the results, hopefully, by the end of this uh, current year. I have no doubt that she will succeed, but we must wait. We must, that's why they play the game, as they say. Okay. Oh, there was one more slide. Um, we know we live in a uh, well-to-do district, and even if we weren't, uh, we know that if we had a staff of five or more, we could expect with five, a member, uh, five members on the staff at $750,000 to be conservative, uh, we'd have an income of three to five million dollars a year as compared to the current income, uh, which runs one, um, under $1 million to about $2 million in a good year. Great. Any other comments? or Trustee Lang. Uh, yes, not a question, just um, really a, a brief comment, and that is I wanted to thank uh, uh, particularly uh, Bill Crosby and Jim Leach, who work on the, our foundation boards on a volunteer basis and give of themselves uh, and their time and commitment, and we very much appreciate uh, your efforts. Uh, and uh, then just also to congratulate our uh, directors, uh, uh, Don, uh, Richard, uh, for the job that you do. Thank you. Great. All right, thank you very much. Uh, two very interesting discussion items. I've been uh, requested that we take a 10-minute break, which we'll do. We'll come back at... Uh, 25 after, please.
Yeah, there he is. waiting for our technical crew. Sorry. <laughs> Control button isn't live. I sent Ty back there to tell him. It's not ready. It's not on. It's not, okay. There's a problem with a, a button here, but all right, we're ready. Uh, we're back after a brief break, and we are at our consent calendar. So, do I have a motion on the consent calendar? Trustee Pinner, yes. So moved. Oh. So moved by Trustee Lang, Second. seconded by Trustee Meldow. Are there any items to be pulled off the consent calendar? Um, I think there's one. I just want to ask one question, which I already asked. Which item is it? Uh, five, five. 5.15 is pulled off the consent calendar. So your motion, Dave, uh, would, yeah. okay. All right, so uh, we will discuss that. Let's vote on 5.1 through 5.14. Okay. Okay, well, our lights are not working, so let's take a lights hand on, vote. Oh, yeah, <laughs> lights are on, nobody's <laughs> home. All right, we're having problems with our lights again. All right, so um, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Carries unanimously. All right. So now we are at 5.15. Trustee Mel. I just have one, one quick question, which I already asked um, our Vice Chancellor Deborah Fitzsimmons, um, and that was because it was brought to my attention that somebody had a question about um, item number um, 5.15, page 2 of 12, um, and there, there was an expense for about $18,000 for In and Out Burgers for Irvine Valley College, and it, it sounds kind of like a, a, a huge expense, but the way you explained it to me, it made some sense. So can you please explain it to our audience and wh whoever asked the question to me of, of that? Thank you. Sure. You're talking about the ratification of the contract for In-N-Out Burger for $17,680. This is for Senior Day at IVC, and it's a student-sponsored event, and they're using students, um, student funds for that. Mm -hmm. And um, perhaps, I, oh, I just wanted to add that um, it is sort of a practice at both colleges for the student groups to um, uh, do several of these for different um, events that a lot of students are in attendance at okay. and in which they'll be participating. And in some cases, um, or in many cases, there are income coming back from the events as well. So um, President Rockmore might be able to fill you in more about the Senior Day event. Thank you. President Rockmore, did you want to comment? Yeah, I would like to add just a little bit. This is... Uh, uh, I believe that that particular vendor has, uh, to my recollection, about six years in a row. Um, we tend to feed about 3,000 uh, incoming, hopefully incoming seniors that, uh, that attend the event, and it is funded by ASIBC and, and approved in their budget. Okay, so I, 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 I'll move approval of this event and of this item unless there's further questions. Moved by Trustee Milchaker, second by um, Trustee I, Lang. Um, uh, we can now vote with our machine, I've been told, so let's vote on the item. Thank you. Okay. All right, matter carries unanimously with one trustee absent. 
one student advisory vote and it looks like we have a problem with the name and trustee Wright is being named <laughs> trustee Fuentes okay so maybe we better vote by <laughs> orally from now on all right so trustee Wright is voted yes all right we will now move to our General action item 6.1. This is uh, acceptance. I'm, so, I'm sorry, we did that. That's the audit report. Mm -hmm. Pardon? We have, to take we have to accept it. Oh, we do need to take action on 6.1. So moved by Trustee Printergast, seconded by Trustee Lang. And at this point, please vote orally. All right? All those in favor of 6.1 acceptance? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, carries unanimously this is, with this one. This is going back to the old style where you have to recognize. Okay, it. we're we're going to yeah, we're <laughs> going to please. Okay, <laughs> we're having technical difficulties again tonight. All right, so now we are at six point two, and that is um, board policy revisions. These are for review and study. Move for approval. Oh. Second. Second. Okay, seconded by Trustee uh, Wright and moved by Trustee Lang to accept these policies listed for review and study. Please vote orally. All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? No. Okay. <laughs> Pardon me. Oh, now we have fixed. All right, so let's vote by computer, I guess. Please, everyone vote by computer. Thank you. All right, matter carries unanimously with a student advisory vote and one trustee absent. Okay. Perfect. 6.3. This is for um, board policy revisions, and this is for discussion and approval. Okay, 6.3. So any comments about approving board policy 3517? Trustee Pendergast. Uh, well, I think we have to move to. Well, yes, but did you want to speak? or I, I do, but I, okay. we have to move to approve before we can discuss it, right? Yes, we do. Right. Move it. So you're moving it and move it. Second. seconded by Trustee Wright. And then I'd like to speak. All right, go for it. Uh, just a, a question on. Uh, Push your mic. Uh, okay, now it's working. All right. All right. Just a question on uh, 3517, um, the student organizations at off campus locations. Just curious if we actually have a problem with criminal activity at off campus sites? No. Um, <laughs> this is basically a required board policy that is required for us to have and it's um, a recommended language from CCLC and basically it's when their student organizations go and have off-campus activities we required if there were to have any kind of criminal activity we have to obviously report that and monitor it so no uh, prevalent uh, criminal activity uh, at this point in time trustee Lang did you want to comment Is your mic on? I can't hear I you. I think so. There you go. Um, and this may apply also, actually, to some of the items that were in 6.2. But um, relative to, um, I guess it's uh, Board Policy 3517, uh, can I assume that this is a brand new policy that's coming to the board for the first time? And, and uh, that otherwise it would, in fact, have um, a date on, or a date on which it was previously adopted, revised, et cetera, et cetera? Yes, you are correct. Okay. Whenever there's um, blue, blue underlined, that's all new language. So this is a totally new pol policy that was for first reading in last month's um, board meeting and then, of course, second meeting today. Okay. okay. Thank you. Trustee, are we, any other comments by trustees? All right, we have a motion and a second. I forget who did that. So let's vote on the item. Carries unanimously with one trustee absent and one student advisory yes vote. All right, we are at 6.3, contract with Nudesic for software development. And we're going to have that presented by Vice Chancellor Brumichi. This is for two projects that were uh, approved by the board uh, in their basic aid allocation. Those came forth uh, from the colleges and were prioritized in the District Technology Council and then approved by the Basic Aid Allocation Resource Committee. These two pro uh, projects include the awards management system, which is to uh, track degrees, certificates, and transfer data, as well as a proof of concept for a context-sensitive help system for my site for students. Okay, very good. Trustee Lang. Move approval. All right. Second by Trustee Wright. No comments or questions. Let's vote on the item. 
Matter carries unanimously with one trustee absent, one student advisory yes vote. 6.5, this is the academic personnel actions. We'd like to make one adjustment to this agenda item. If we could pull all of item B, this will be coming back. We're discussing this issue of department chair compensation with the faculty association, and we came to some conclusions after this was submitted. So we'd like to pull item B. You'll see it again next month, slightly modified. Okay. A question? Yes, Trustee Wright. Uh, as I look through this, this was the same amounts that was given last year. That's why we, I like to pull it. Okay, that's why you're pulling it. Mm -hmm. Okay. okay. <laughs> All right. Any other comments or questions? Okay. Do we have a motion to approve this item? Trustee Lang. Second. Seconded by Trustee Meldow. Okay, let's vote on the item. Okay, matter carries unanimously with one student advisory yes vote and one trustee absent. 6.6, .6, classified personnel action. I have to pull item B1. All right, pull item B1. And that is, let's see. It's a, uh, it's a new position. We, want to, we need to discuss it a little bit further. It's a dispatcher lead. Oh, dispatcher lead. Okay, very good. All right, with that adjustment, um, do I hear a motion for this item? So moved. Second. Trustee Pendergast moved and Trustee Melchegger seconded. Seeing no one wishing to speak, let's vote on the item. Trustee Wright, okay. Matter carries unanimously with one student advisory yes vote and one trustee absent. So we are now at reports. So we'll start with uh, 7.1. This is list of board requested reports. Any comments or updates on that? All right, we'll move to 7.2, Saddleback and Urban Valley College speakers. No comments or questions. The 7.3 is the basic aid report. And no comments, these are our standard reports. 7.4, facilities plan status report. Seeing no comments, 7.5, the retiree trust fund report, okay. And we've heard about that through the audit, or the 7.6 quarterly investment report. Okay, no comments. 7.7, .7, monthly financial status report. Okay, no comments. 7.8, academic year, non-resident tuition fees, foreign and out of state. No comments? All right, we are now at our reports from our shared governance groups. We'll start with Saddleback College Academic Senate. Thank you, uh, Madam President. You, I left on your, uh, on your uh, desk area earlier to, uh, this evening um, a written report here, and my comments are at the top in the bold. But what you have, and I'm going to highlight uh, one of these programs uh, each time uh, during the next uh, uh, several months, another level of how we're trying to improve what's going on in our classes. And this is provided by one of the librarians. And while we have a new building, we also have some new ideas that are in the building. And we wanted to share them with you. And you can read this over at your leisure. We also have, I might add, a reading uh, program that has been tailoring some of its uh, coursework to specific divisions. So nursing was the first one. Uh, students needed help with reading textbooks that are quite technical. And so that has been a good augmentation of staff needs from one area to staff needs in another area and supporting our students. Um, the second thing I wanted to talk about uh, and to stress is the issue of part-time faculty members. You heard Deanna say that our part-time faculty do not oftentimes keep office hours, partly because they have no place to keep office hours in. And so with half of our um, over half of our courses being taught by part-time faculty, that's an enormous impact on students. They're not compensated, of course, to have office hours, uh, though some of them try to have them. And some divisions have you know, some space, but it's inadequate. And uh, if student success is to be successful, we have to figure out some way, it's certainly Saddleback, to bring these individuals into the fold as though they are as professional as the rest of us and doing the same kind of work that our students need. Thank you. Okay, great. Thank you. And our faculty association president, Paula Jacob. 
Thank you. I don't have a report, but I would like, on behalf of the uh, leadership of the association, to congratulate Trustees Jay, Wright, and Lang on the outcome of the election. And I'd like to extend best wishes to Trustee Meldow, who was, would have been our endorsed candidate in Area 7 had he uh, chosen to run. Uh, but best wishes as you leave the board. Okay. Thank you very much. Reverend Valley College, Academic Senate, Kathy Smidler. Thank you very much. Thank you. It is it coming through? There we go. Yes. <laughs> um, <laughs> the Irvine Valley College Senate is working with the president and the administration in particular, but with the entire college community to try to work on, <clears throat> work together consultatively to work out budgetary issues and, uh, and try to find reasonable ways to make reductions that are required of us. Um, and in general, the Senate is working consultatively with the administration on a number of issues that are arising in the college, as well as planning our next accreditation go around. Great, thank you. Associate Vice Chancellor of Economic Development, Randy Peoples. Thank you, no report. All right, great. And Vice, our President of uh, Irvine Valley College, Dr. Glenn Rockmore. I almost got demoted again there. Oh. Yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, no, Don't that's fine. Personal. <laughs> yes. Uh, congratulations again, uh, Trustee Lang, Trustee Wright, Trustee Jay, and soon to be uh, Trustee Jamal on your successful runs. And uh, also, I would like to thank uh, Trustees Wright and Prendergast for coming to our veterans uh, program. I hope you enjoyed listening to our student veterans that gave speeches there. Uh, the accreditation follow-up went absolutely smoothly. Uh, I had a hunch it was going to go well when the chair walked into my office and said, you know, Glenn, I really don't know why I'm here. Um, <laughs> oh, nice. And that's a quote, so he probably doesn't want that broadcast. But um, And then when he left, he said that uh, we just were absolutely A+. Plus. And so okay. I think all of that's going to come out really well. So again, thanks to uh, Lisa Davis-Allen, who was the then Academic Senate President, our yes. current Academic Senate President, Kathy Schmeidler, uh, Kathy Worley, our Dean Kathy Worley that worked on that, and in fact, our very own uh, Thomas uh, Thien down here had input on that as well from the ASIVC. So um, one another comment that was made that the report was absolutely well written and well documented, and that's critical that yes. that, that happened. So uh, kudos to everybody on that. And then finally, I had a, a really great thing happen is that um, the president of our uh, classified Senate and our Vice President of our Classified Senate, I'm speaking of Dennis Gordon down here, and Angela Mahaney invited me to be a co-author with them on a paper that we presented recently, uh, just last week at the Community College League uh, conference. And the topic was on how classified senates uh, can successfully incorporate into uh, effective participation and uh, actually serve as a, a tool to help improve communication. And we had an absolute full room. Uh, we had a trustee. We had three presidents there. Uh, we had faculty and, and classified staff as well. And so uh, I would like to congratulate our classified senate speakers for doing such a wonderful job at a very high-profile uh, presentation. So, Great. thank you. Wonderful, wonderful. All right, President Burnett, Saddleback College. Thank you. Uh, first, once again, congratulations, uh, Trustee Lang, Trustee Jay, Trustee Wright, uh, and soon to be Trustee Jamal. Um, also, uh, once again, again, thank you, thank you, Dr. Meldow. Absolutely uh, fantastic uh, what you've done for this district and this board. Just thank you in every way from all of us. Uh, ditto on accreditation, thank you. Uh, Dr. Rockmar, our chair, said basically the same thing. In fact, they said it on the phone before they even came to the college, uh, that same comment. So congratulations to our whole district and the amazing progress that's been made on accreditation. And, uh, and thank you once again to our governance groups led by our Academic Senate, Classified Senate, ASG, and of course our management team. Um, I wanted to thank Dr. Wright for, if you haven't heard or read yet, uh, he gave a moving 
um, speech at our Veterans Day ceremony, and uh, we actually have it posted. And uh, just thank you again uh, for not only being there, but of course being our guest speaker and doing a wonderful job. And thank you, Chancellor, for attending. Um, just uh, it's that time of the year. Uh, we have the holidays among us, and uh, we have our annual Department of Music, um, actually 25th annual Feast of Lights performance. Uh, we'll be give, sending out invitations to all of you. In fact, you have them. And uh, December 2nd, we'll be inviting you for a special presentation. Uh, also, we'll have the, our Saddleback Annual Holiday Open House for all of our employees, and you're all invited as well on Wednesday, December 12th. Um, one of the things that's really special and I'm very proud of our college and our district is that uh, our, our college just partnered with a group called Helping Hand Worldwide, and that's to provide groceries actually for our needy students, uh, which includes all of our student groups, veterans, etc. And uh, on the first and third Wednesday now of each month, we're providing groceries to our needy students. Uh, I think that's just a wonderful thing, and that's all volunteer and partnering with one of our local nonprofits to, to, to do that. Uh, and uh, with that, that's a wonderful way to say Happy Thanksgiving. Thank you very much. And our Vice Chancellor of Technology and Learning Services, Dr. Bob Brunucci. We're scheduled at the end of the month to release MySite Mobile, which will be added to the existing suite of mobile apps we have that's been downloaded over 14,000 times. It's going to add personalized services. It uses our Sherpa recommendation engines to provide personalized announcements, personalized course lists, personalized calendar, personalized to-do list. So we're very excited about that. Jim Gaston and I uh, were in Denver recently presenting at uh, Educause. That's uh, the largest university educational technology show. Uh, we presented a session that was uh, uh, videoed and streamed. Uh, I have uh, met with some uh, representatives from publishers uh, uh, who are trying to figure out how to make their digital uh, wares more affordable for students. And uh, lastly, uh, we've been contacted by Western Governors University who are impressed by uh, a Sherpa presentation they saw recently. And so we're in discussions with them about uh, how we could uh, both kind of learn from each other's efforts to improve student services through personalization. Thank you very much. And our Vice Chancellor of Human Resources, Dr. David Bouquet. During this fall, during the legislative activity, one thing that happened that will affect us to some extent here at our district. Uh, during the pension reform, the, what happened was the retirees, once you retire now from either PERS or STRS, you're required to sit out for 180 days. Now that will have an impact on us because we have a large batch of 37 classified staff leaving. We may not employ them for, for basically six months afterwards as subs, and we, we'd hope to do that. The STIRS has a different spin to it. Uh, you can come back and work, except every dollar you earn has to go back to STIRS, so they get to work for free, which is kind of creative. <laughs> so, so on that, I want to wish all of you ha happy Thanksgiving. <laughs> thank you very much. And our Vice Chancellor of Business Services, Dr. No Corbett. report tonight. All right, thank you. And IVC Classified Senate. Thank you. Uh, I just wanted to thank uh, uh, President Rockmore again uh, for his comments about the CCLC presentation. It was absolutely fantastic, as he said. Uh, the presentation was on enhancing uh, performance and accountability uh, at the institution. And a lot of that really is, uh, uh, I have to congratulate all of you on the board because uh, the discussions uh, were framed around uh, having uh, a lot of communication, having transparency, and uh, the board has certainly done that for us uh, and certainly uh, given us an opportunity as classified Senate to participate at a governance level that really was unheard of for a lot of the colleges that were there. Uh, as a matter of fact, Glenn was actually being very, uh, uh, very generous because uh, a lot of the comments went to him as a president uh, for, for supporting us as strongly as he has, and I wanted to thank him and thank the board and uh, our chancellor for, uh, for supporting us also. Thank you, and happy Thanksgiving. Thank you. And our class, uh, California School Employees Association president? Sarah Shabani. Nice thank you. Um, on behalf of CSCA, I would like to thank, thank the you. Board of Trustees for approving uh, our classified employee retirement incentive. There will be um, 37 retirees uh, district-wide, and CSCA is honoring, honoring those individuals at both our November and December chapter meetings, um, So, most of whom they've had served more than 15 years within our district and as many as 32, so they'll be missed. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. And our Saddleback College... Uh, classified Senate President Don Manio. Thank you and congratulations on your elections and the elections that affect our state so much. Um, you saw the report today on the foundation and how that classified employees helped the college as well as 
helping that direction and of student success. And as you see many of these people leaving, hope you keep in mind how, again, the bang for your buck is actually on that full-time employee. Um, we had 37 baskets actually already correct, collected for our veterans program. And then at the last minute, we had 22 more requests came in. So actually, uh, thanks to Tracy McConnell and Catherine Bears, and really everyone at Saddleback College in the district, we actually met that quota of, uh, or the request of 59 baskets. And uh, we really have to thank the entire team because it's not just classified, it's everyone that actually gave. And even if it was just one can of soup, it's giving. Um, we had, uh, oh, thank you to CSCA for honoring those people that are retiring because there was nothing really formal put together. So each college was doing its own thing. So really after 32 years of work, um, they should be recognized, and we thank CSCA for doing that. And then again, thank you, uh, happy Thanksgiving, and enjoy the holiday. Okay, and our Associated Student Government President of uh, IVC, Thomas Dan. Okay, good evening, everyone. Uh, please allow me to repeat it again. I would like to congratulate our trustees, Mr. Lang, Mr. Wright, and Mr. Jay, for keep continuing to support and serve our community. And as for trustee, Mr. Meldar, I we're, I think the whole community is greatly appreciated for your contribution to the community. And other than that, ESIVC doesn't didn't have any event this month. All the students are busy with their applications and personal statements and cramming to write the papers. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Well, happy Thanksgiving yeah, happy to everyone, Thanksgiving. and this will conclude our meeting. Thank you very much.